Right, so hi. Um, I'm here to talk about hacking gently. Um, so what that is, or who I am, before we get into any of that. Um, I'm a German-born, American-raised blacksmith. Um, I specialize in traditional methods. Uh, when I was nine, I made a nail. I got completely addicted, started classes at 12. Um, apprenticed at the Hancock Shaker Village for four years and then ran that forge for a couple more years. And then I started my own business in 2017. So, why am I here? Um, I'm going to be talking about the history of steel, so what it actually is on a chemical level. Um, how this is hacking, because while it seems a little weird, it is. Um, the parts of, of a knife and the language surrounding knives, so that everyone knows what I'm talking about if I say things like edge geometry or cancer, whatever. Um, how those things translate into real life, uh, different uses for edge geometry. Um, different temper colors and their purpose, and why you should or should not change the angle, because that's an option. So let's start at the beginning with history. At some point, some guy saw a rock like that and decided to crush it and put it through a sieve until he had that, then heat it up with coal or charcoal, and they ended up with that weird sponge-looking thing. So that is iron in its most basic form um, after you apply heat. In this iron, there's an, almost no carbon, and that makes it incredibly soft. There's, I'm going to be getting this into this in a bit. Um, there's a trade-off for strength, softness, edge retention, and um, overall performance, and you sort of have to pick which ones match what you're doing at that moment. So here's the, that chart. Um, edge retention, mainly at this point, um, commercially available knives are made out of stainless steel, and that's great. They don't rust. Um, they're easier to make, but they're softer, and they have chromium. So adding different things to iron changes the effect. If you add carbon, you get a harder uh, metal in the end. If you add silica, you get a more um, resistant metal to things like warpage and cracking. Um, yeah, it's all about just sort of finding the balance. So, here are the words. Uh, butt, handle, tang, bolster, heel, spine, edge, tip, and point. Um, I'm mainly going to be focusing on talking about the edge and the tip today, um, because those are the most universally useful parts. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of doubt realistically that any of you are going to go out and make knives based on this talk, mm -hmm. but <laughs> what you could do is take that one kitchen knife that you have that's garbage and turn it into something good. Um, tempering and tempering colors. These are the first things you should be looking at in knives. If you hold a knife at an angle, you can see the different colors inside the steel. So there's blues, there's pinks, there's browns, everything. Um, as you increase the temperature, the, cha uh, the color changes. And that's how we gauge temperature, because it's faster. Um, things that are up here at the bluer end of the spectrum um, are very soft. They won't hold an edge very well, but if you need something that's flexible, like a uh, fencing sword, it's perfect. Um, down here at the 350, 400, 440 mark, um, that's most chef's knives. They're made to be not quite brittle, but one step below it, um, at least with Western knives. Japanese knives, it's different. They make it way harder because they don't need to hack through bone, so they don't have to worry about their knife breaking. Edge geometries. Those are the things that actually make knives cut. Um, Western knives have edge geometries that are wider. Um, they're more similar to axes like this one. Um, so that, one side is flat, the other side is an angle. Um, that lets you take something that's round and turn it square, but if you're left-handed, you can't use this axe because of the direction of that belt. Um, hollow edges are what you're going to find on straight razors, not really applicable to this. 
uh, chisel edge, Japanese knives, uh, convex edges, and V edges are the most common in Western knives, um, and those are the easiest to sharpen, I think. Um, so how and why do we change edge geometry? If your knife that is garbage in the kitchen is cutting vegetables at odd angles or not straight, or not even cutting them at all, you need to start looking at what the edge geometry is. Um, traditional methods, rocks, basically, um, and sandpaper. You sit there for hours and hours and hours with these things, um, and take off little tiny pieces of the steel. Um, you can pass this recording block. Exactly. Um, the lower the grit, the more metal you take off in each swipe. So that one is 220, and then this one is 8,000. 1,000? Yeah. Wow. I didn't know they got uh, that fine. Oh, they go higher. Do they really? Yeah, the um, Japanese swordsmiths have a room filled with these kinds of stones. That's crazy. Yeah, everything from like 50 to, you know, 50,000. Contemporary methods um, rely on engine-powered grindstones. It's the same concept, but with an engine attached, instead of pushing it with your foot or just your hands. Um, my problem with these is that you can heat up the blade really quickly on them and turn the tip or part of the edge blue. If you do that, you have effectively re-tempered the blade in that section, and it will never hold an edge again. Um, so, I like older waterstone methods. Um, yeah. Changing edge geometry is as simple as looking at what existing edge is, how it works, and changing it to suit your purposes. If you're cutting through softer things, vegetables like tomatoes, fish, that kind of stuff, you want a very thin knife, you want something flexible, and you want an edge geometry of around seven degrees. Um, Euro er, yeah, European knives have more of a convex edge geometry because they're designed to cut through bone and flesh, as opposed to soft, more delicate things like fish. Um, yeah, so sharpening at home. Sharpening knives isn't as hard as many people seem to think it is. It, don't get me wrong, it's not easy. There are a lot of different methods you can use. A lot of them make it really easy. Some of them are a little more complex like these. Um, you need to first match the angle that is existing um, if you're just trying to sharpen uh, with a lower grit and then go up to a higher grit. You're trying to polish the very, very edge of the knife to be as smooth and shiny as you can because if you do that, you know that you have a very fine surface and that uh, requires less pressure to slice through the same thing. Uh, these guys recommend putting coins um, underneath the spine of your knife so that when you slide them back and forth, it can't move up or down. Um, my only problem with that is that it fills the uh, pores and stones with uh, copper or nickel, and that will adversely affect you as you keep going. Going up through the grits, um, it takes practice, but you will sort of stop feeling an improvement in the edge quality uh, while you're sharpening, then you know, you need to move up. So changing the edge geometry, uh, and this is the part where it's actually getting into hacking. You're taking um, a knife that has a existing purpose and breaking it. You're saying, okay, I don't want that anymore. I'm butchering more fish these days, so I'm going to take the edge geometry and make it slim. Um, so, of course, first figure out what your actual angle is, so that you're not just adjusting in some direction. Um, figure out what you're trying to cut with it, and that'll form what angle you use, and then actually go about modifying it. So the takeaways from this, uh, the steel matters. The kind of steel that your knife is made out of is going to greatly affect how long it can hold an edge. Um, 
if you get something that's too hard and you drop it once, you will crack it. Steel is, when you harden it and temper it, there are a lot of internal stresses in the steel, millions of micro fractures. So if you take a piece of steel that's only been hardened and tap it on the table, it just splits. When you temper it, so raise the temperature up a couple hundred degrees, you relieve all those stresses and it can still hold an edge, but it is soft enough that it doesn't just break. Um, the edge matters. Check your edge geometry before you start changing things. Figure out what is wrong with the knife you're using before you start just changing stuff. It, the changes in the knife will sneak up on you, so you'll think you're sitting there for six hours not making any progress, and then all of a sudden, it's just totally different, and you might have messed it up. The edge can be hacked. You can take a cleaver and turn it into a scalpel. That's an option. You just need to change the angle at which the knife is actually terminating. Um, knives can be sharpened. There are lots of tools and ways to sharpen, as I said. Um, I like traditional Japanese or Chinese whetstones. Um, I know a lot of people like things like Wicked Edge. It's a little vise that has arms connected to it that's set at very specific angles that you can just roll and adjust and slide pieces down the blade. That works. It's fine. It's kind of expensive, but you don't need to practice. Um, yeah, the trick really is to commit to learning to sharpen well. If you want to do traditional methods, it's going to take longer. Um, you will, at the end, have a more custom edge than you would if you used one of those machines, and you know for a fact that you're not going to overheat enough, which is very, very different. Um, <laughs> basically, what you'll do is spend you know, $3,000 on this beautiful knife that's been handmade in Japan, and then you put it on your grinder once and it's ruined. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm begging you, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> um, sharpening well is easier than it seems. It's all about matching the geometry. You can do it with your eyes. You don't even, you don't need high power tools. You don't need um, electrochromatic graphs to figure out the exact density of this, all that stuff. You just need to look at it most of the time. And if you know what you're looking for, these things are pretty trivial to solve. Um, I'm going to be doing a demo on sharpening, and I'll be adjusting the edge geometry on one of the sides of this knife. Um, I sharpened this this morning, just sort of as practice, um, but I don't like the way that the edge on the left is um, thicker than the one on the right. So that's a more convex geometry. Meaning that it's harder to make fine cuts. And because that thing is so lightweight, you don't want to be putting a whole bunch of pressure on it. You can do it. It's check YouTube, check all these things. You don't need to invest in these kinds of stones. You can start with sandpaper. Um, if you take low grit sandpaper and just put it on a table and rub it at the right angle, it will totally work. It's not quite as um, <laughs> romantic as sitting there with whetstones for a couple of hours, but it gets the job done. Um, emery paper is what you're looking for. Standard um, aluminum oxide sandpaper breaks really, really quickly when you start rubbing it on steel. Do you wet the paper at all, or oil it or anything? The paper, the paper? you can do wet or dry. Uh, those stones, you have to soak in it for around 10 minutes in water before you use them. Okay. They're incredibly porous. These things are basically sponges. When you put them in water, it bubbles like you threw an alcohol accessory. Um, once those pores are filled, you are you can be sure that there's enough water on the surface of the stone to serve as a lubricant for the steel. It also ensures that you aren't filling all the little pockets with steel fibers. Because that will ruin your stone. Yeah. Um, that's Basically, my talk. Uh, any questions? So, well, when you're sharpening with the paper, yes. What is the best? Or does it depend on what knife you're using? As far as the grade. Ah, uh, always start at a low grade. Um, the lower the grade, the more metal you're going to be taking off. So, unless you have chips taken out of the edge of a knife, don't go below 500. Just, it's not worth it. It'll take forever. Um, if you have chips in an edge like this. 
uh, or somebody had a rock or something, um, you need to go down to like 50 grit, like this stuff, mm -hmm. um, and really just start moving all the metal up until the lowest point of those chips, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, start to finish, this knife took around 20 hours. Um, when I got it, it was a coil spring for a truck. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of my knives are made out of sort of reclaimed materials. Um, I take a lot of garage door opener springs and use those because they have great carbon content. Um, but yeah, unless I need to know exactly what how the knife is going to perform, I won't buy skin. It's just a headache. <laughs> yeah. So that one knife in your kitchen that is absolutely garbage, you still haven't thrown it out. It's sitting there. Every time you see it, you think about grabbing it, but then you remember how old it is. Mm -hmm. Odds are that's because it has two convex and edge geometry. Cheap knives, they send the blanks, so the knife that's doesn't have a handle yet, not polished. They send those on a conveyor belt to angle grinders. Uh, these dudes. And they're set to a 45 degree angle, and the knife goes through once, and that's sharp for them. I don't do that. I sit there for six hours, you know, making everything perfect. You can change it. And that's really sort of the point I'm trying to get across. You don't need to spend $900 on a knife to get something good. You can go to a thrift store and pick up a $2 knife and just change it. Fix it. Yeah. And there are, if you guys Google knife sharpening, mm -hmm. there's going to be a million different methods. Um, the stuff I'm talking about today, that's not all of it. Not even close. Um, but what I'm trying to get across is that changing metal isn't as hard as people seem to think. It's not a constant material. It's always changing. So why not change it to your purposes? Where do you get the emery cloth from? Is that just like at Lowe's or? Yeah, you can get it at Ace. Okay. Um, it's I think a dollar a sheet. Okay. It's, it's more expensive than regular sandpaper. It lasts longer than it's worth it. They go up that, or I should say that, fine of a grit, like at a typical hardware store? Or? At a typical hardware store, you can get at least up to 1,500 grit. Okay. Um, and that's plenty sharp for any applications. Okay. Um, unless you're trying to perform surgery with these knives, you usually don't have to go past 2,000 grit. Okay. Yeah. Is there a way I can tell the stones that I have? Because I got stones that are hand me down stones. But is there a way I can tell whether they're any good or not, or if this stone to stone is good? Oh, absolutely. Um, so if you want to figure out what grit it is, that's a little bit more complicated. Basically, just sit there with an assortment of sandpaper, rub the sandpaper, and rub the stone, figure out what's the same. Okay. Um, if the stone has waves in it. Yeah. And that's caused by sharpening one spot over and over again. You wear out the stone, get this bow. Mm -hmm. um, that's a serious issue, um, and you need to resurface the stone. And that's an option. All you have to do is take a single block and rub the stone on it. That's it. Hmm. Yeah. Knife maintenance. Um, keep the blades dry if they're carbon steel. If not, don't worry about it. Please, 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 please do not soak the handles of your knives, ever. Doesn't matter what they're made out of. However they're connected, like the handle material is connected to the steel, mm -hmm. there's something there that really doesn't like getting wet. Keep knives dry, keep them sharp, um, and you'll have a good time. Yeah, you don't need a super expensive knife to cook really good food. You don't need a really expensive knife for it to be sharp even. You just need to know some of the ideas behind it. So when you say don't soak the handles um, for kitchen knives and that kind of stuff, keep them out of the dishwasher? Ah, uh, never put sharp knives in the dishwasher. Just don't do it. It'll ruin the edge completely. Like that, you could take a scalpel, put it in the uh, dishwasher, take it out, it's a butter knife. 
So she gave you knives. <laughs> yes, just buying you knives every time. In fact, buy them from me. That's even better. Um, being in a binary, where, where do we find you online or for for that kind of thing? Ah, I am at Rocky Hill Forge. Um, I also have business cards that I have. Oh, that's right. You can yeah. take one of your cards. Oh, all right. I'd love to get our cards. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Do you that picture was? Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Of course. I'm looking to see if I can find a picture of this knife I was asking you about. Oh. So for an everyday pocket knife that yes. I would carry, um, is, do you have a specific angle that you tend to like more than another, or? It really depends on what you're doing. Um, the edge geometry is not defined by the shape of the blade. Right. Completely separate. Um, if you're cutting cardboard boxes open um, and you just need something that will slash through stuff, get a convex edge. Okay. It, even if it goes dull, you can still cut things with it. Mm -hmm. Or with a super slim edge geometry, the whole edge just gets rounded and you won't have a good time cutting anything. Um, I like, personally, slimmer edge geometries for everything. Um, I just find it easier to cut through things. Mm -hmm. um, Wusthof does something like a 45, no, 35 degree angle on their knives. I do seven. So, wow. yeah, a little bit of a... A little bit of a difference. There. <laughs> yeah, and again, that's why I don't really prefer the um, uh, Wicked Sharp models. They, don't get me wrong, they're great. They will put a fantastic edge on any of your knives as long as they are commercially available and Western. If they are Japanese, don't even think about it. It's too expensive and it takes, there are too many little pieces you need to add on where you could just spend 50 bucks and get one of those stones. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I use on mine is one of those, you attach the arm to it and you, you know, yeah, point exactly. it on the knife and yeah, that's what I do with mine. I got mine set at right about 20, 25 and it works pretty good, but I find that it does go dull relatively fast. Okay, and the other, um, the other portions to consider um, are the type of steel that's being used and how the temper was. Um, the temper will determine the lifespan of an edge more than anything, okay. um, aside from maybe the type of steel you're using. Um, there are now contemporary air hardening alloys where um, you make the knife, take it out, you sharpen it. Um, as it gets more exposure to oxygen, it gets harder and stronger. Eventually, you won't even be able to scratch it with sandpaper. It just it won't happen. Wow. You will not lose that edge, ever. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Now the drawbacks to these are that, um, yeah, so right here, super high toughness, super high edge retention, completely garbage ease of sharpening, and corrosion resistance will probably be pretty high, but at what cost? Like, <laughs> right. how practical is it going to be to have a knife that you can never sharpen? Um, I have found that the easiest knives to sharpen are ones like these. This is not one piece of steel, but three that I weld together in the forge. Um, there is a sliver of high carbon steel in the middle and mild steel on the edges. The mild steel takes the majority of the impact from work, while the high carbon steel is only used to actually get that beginning cut. This is, as a result, easier to sharpen and holds an edge longer. So how do you clean your knives? Like, clean them? Yeah. Um, I use Dawn and a sponge and just go over the blade. Oh. I don't usually clean the handle all that much. Okay. Um, unless it's you know covered in blood and gore, then you might want to wash it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just dry knife handles off. They can warp, they can crack, bad things can happen. Yeah. Um, oh, if you're buying an antique knife, and it is a carbon steel, like a sabatier or an opinel. If you leave them wet for 
I'm not kidding, 30 seconds, you can watch it rust. Wow. Oh, yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> yeah. Um, that black stuff on the outside of that knife is actually also a type of rust. It only forms at very high temperatures. It's harder than the steel itself, um, and it's really annoying to get off. How do you have to get that off? Um, well, that stone right there, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. This um, this green stone mm -hmm. is a really low grit, so I can get it off whatever I want. Um, but for that one, uh, my high school actually excuse me, had a program uh, where we had to do some sort of project, a service project to finish, uh, to graduate. I went and volunteered at the museum and made this knife, um, and somehow managed to graduate. <laughs> well, no, because like everyone else was doing like, you know, aquatic research and climbing the Himalayas, stuff like that, and I was just like, I'm, I'm going to stay in the museum and make a knife. That's my plan. Um, yeah. Classical knives uh, that are made out of carbon steel, they will hold an edge longer, but they'll rust almost instantly, unless you keep them dry and wet. Um, oil for the handles really doesn't need to be that complex. Um, I used to use olive oil to uh, fix my handles. I think that was done with olive oil. Um, I have now swapped to tongue oil, which you can get on Amazon for like six bucks a bottle. Um, and you can refinish not 40 or 50 knives of a bottle. It's great stuff. No, uh, yeah, uh, it's mostly used for finishing cutting boards. It's like, it's food safe, it's all natural, it's just, it makes the wood nicer and it repels water a little bit. And it doesn't make it slick to hold on to? No. Um, that knife right there, I sanded up to 2,000 grit and then finished it with that tongue oil. Mm -hmm. And the result is just sort of a silky feeling. It's almost got a little bit of a tack to it, to where you can feel like it wants to. Yeah. It's, it's easy to hold on to where you think when, when you say, I put oil on something, you think it's going to be... Yeah, just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, the oil... Um, tongue oil takes a couple of hours or days to dry, depending on how many layers you do. I do, like, one or two, mm -hmm. and that's good enough. I'm just trying to um, show the grain in the handle, and uh, it just makes it a whole lot prettier. <laughs> Um, cleavers, uh, you can use them, just make sure they're sharp, because, yeah, I've known some people who are missing a couple of fingers because of that. <laughs> yeah, um, knives and knife sharpening, it's a lot of fun, it takes practice, um, and you have to, of course, be careful. I mean, I, my hands are so messed up at this point I can't use fingerprint readers. Um, it just doesn't recognize it. <laughs> so you don't have a passport? I have a passport. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got the passport before my fingers got so messed up, and I'm lucky, but if I try to unlock my computer with my thumbprint, just... I've never met this person in my life. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, very interesting. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, that was a... Well, a lot of learning. Very informative. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> a little bit more goes into it. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm going to put him on the dishwasher again. Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> yes! That's all you I need to hear. The extra step. <laughs> Just, if you want to do less work, don't put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, there you go. I remember this guy. Somebody used his knife to cook and he wasn't there and they put the knife in the dishwasher and it came out, it was very rusted. It was so oh, rusty. No. And it was a favorite knife. He was very upset. It took him days to take the rust off. Yeah. And he put a no, do not put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, if you were to take either one of these knives and put them in the dishwasher, they would be completely orange when you pull them out. Yes, that's what happened to his knife. It yeah. was this orange. And you end up having to sit there. Yes, that's what he was doing. Yeah, with a little tiny piece of sandpaper, your fingers turn black, your clothes are all black. He was very upset. Yeah. Now I know why. I understand why. Because <laughs> the steel gets damaged. Yeah. That um, 
that rust is a layer of the steel coming off and kind of oh, oxidized. Oh, yes. Exactly. So you're taking off the top layer where everything's shiny and bright and beautiful and you're turning it into carpet. So do you sell the stone itself or just the knives? I sell the knives. I okay. bought these stones uh, from a website called Corin, oh. uh, K-O-R-I-N. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, these are by far the best stones I've ever used. Um, they are reasonably priced. You're not going to be breaking your wallet getting a couple of these. Mm -hmm. um, and they will last forever if you take care of them properly. So let them air dry before you put them back in the box. Okay. Yeah. Um, soak them before you use them. The higher grits, um, don't soak them in water before. Like when you get up to 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, the stones can warp and if you soak them for too long. So just pour some water over the top. Yeah. If we could get stones, how many different ones would you say would be a good number to start with? For most people, I would say one or two is plenty. Okay. Um, I'm doing stuff that most people don't ever have to do. I'm making the edges. Um, so you need something really low like this. Mm -hmm. If you get a thousand grit stone, you should be set for all of your kitchen knives. That's, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a mid-range stone. Yeah. Um, it won't be too expensive. It should be 50 bucks, something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, it wasn't too boring. No, it wasn't. Very interesting. Okay. What time are you doing the sharpening demo? Oh, I'm going to be going out there like now and just sort of pottering around and sharpening. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've just been doing that all day. Okay, cool.